Hi, my name is Wanda Hawk. I am currently 63 years old. I have two stories to tell you today. And my friend Zazu here is here because he would interrupt up us too many times. So I'm going to start with my childhood story. When I was just nine years old, about a month later, there was a family picnic where my father and his best friend and his family and a couple of other people went up to a lake where he was building a cottage, the friend, and we ended up having a very bad boating accident where we ended up losing my father's friend's wife. Her name was Nora, um, my father, and then also my older sister, Debbie, who was not quite 12 at the time. So. It was a Saturday morning. We were going to, at first, go to a picnic with another relative. But at the last minute, Bob phoned and asked if Dad would come up to the cottage and help him with building the walls or something. So the drive was about an hour and a half, two hours from Ottawa. And we had never been before. And we got to the lake and it was very nice. And we were spending a very nice day. The men did what they had to do with the cottage and then went out fishing in the morning. And then in the afternoon, Bob had promised that he would take us all for a boat ride. And the kids were all excited about that. So while most of the men were resting on shore, my father, two, possibly three other men were resting on the shore and what happened was the boat was just a little fishing boat that was only supposed to hold five and it was overloaded with eight of us. There was Bob and his wife and their two very small children who were still in diapers at the time. My mother and us three children. Oh, my brother was younger than me and he was in the boat also. So there was eight of us in the boat and we started out for a boat ride and somewhere along the way the motor conked out and the boat flipped over and nobody could swim. What I was told happened was my brother had a fake leather jacket that he zipped up really tight and it got up air underneath it and acted as a life jacket for him. And apparently I was hanging on to him somehow underneath the water, but they did what they had to to find everybody. And when they found me, I was lifeless. And it just so happened that one of the men on the shore had seen a TV show recently about a new thing called CPR. And so he said, well, let me see if I can do this and if it will help. So what happened to me was I didn't see a light. I didn't see a stairway or anything like that. I ended up being in this room that was in semi-darkness. And there were lots and lots of people in this room and I describe it now as a family reunion. It was like everybody knew me and everybody was related to me and some were friends and some were family. And there was just so much love. And it was like sitting by a fireplace with a warm quilt on, it was that much love. So I'm looking around and I'm a little confused, but I'm also very happy. And suddenly I hear my grandmother's voice and granny had died the year before. And she said to me, Wanda, it's not your time. You have to go back. And I said to her, but Granny, I want to stay with you. And then I heard my father's voice, which was very confusing to me. And he said, no, Wanda, it's time for you to go back. And I need you to promise me that you'll take care of your mother. And I said, OK, Daddy, but I want to stay. And he said, no, it's time to go back. So I woke up and I was in a house somewhere that I'd never been before and in a room by myself and I had no clothes on and I started yelling for my mother. I just wanted to tell you what I was told happened while I was on the other side. The motor conked out, the boat started taking on water and my mother and Nora started to panic and they stood up when they realized the water was coming in the boat. And it was their standing up that flipped the boat. And it was, as you know, capsized and the bottom was on the top. And nobody could swim, not Bob, not my mother, not Nora. None of his children had ever had swimming lessons at the time. So what I was told was Nora was on one side of the boat and my mother on the other. And between the two of them, they were able to grab the two babies and put them on top of the boat. And they were light enough that it didn't sink the boat. And then 
Debbie ended up on Nora's side of the boat and they were hanging on by their fingers. And mother was on the other side, hanging on by the fingers. And my brother and I were somewhere too far for anybody to reach from the flipped over boat. What I was told was my sister Debbie started to panic. And as they say, you're 10 times stronger when you panic and that type of thing. So in her panicking, she grabbed onto Nora and we were told that that's how Nora drowned was Debbie pulled her under. On the other side, while things were happening and the people realized that there was had been an accident, my father ran around and the two men also ran around to try to get closer to the area. They were able to find another boat eventually and get everybody as they could. But they didn't put mother back into the boat because they were afraid that that boat was also going to capsize. They were able to find Nora right away when the alarm was sounded. But it took over two days for them to find my father and my sister. And I just think it just shows the love that my father like sacrificed to be able to get to my sister. Because when they did find him, he was floating obviously by this point and when they went to pick him up he literally had his arms around my sister and they were able to get them both together that way. It took two maybe three days before I even saw my mother again. One of my uncles came up and brought my brother and I back to the city and we stayed with them until mother was able to come and tell us that dad and Debbie were no longer with us. With the boat accident, Nora, she drowned, my sister drowned, and my father also, even though he was on the shore, ran around the lake and jumped past a swampy area and jumped into a boat that had no oars. So he started swimming towards where the boat had been overturned. Now, my father was a very good swimmer, and he used to, for fun, swim the width of a river that's near our place, the Ottawa River, as a teenager, just for fun. So he was a very good swimmer. But by the time he had gotten to the boat, my sister had panicked and had already pulled down Bob's wife, Nora. And it, as I said, she drowned. By the time my father got to Debbie, she also pulled him under and he also died. So in that day, we lost three people. But I had this really amazing, life-changing visions, near-death experience, whatever people want to call it. People have told me all kinds of things over the years, but that was my first one as a child. And it really changed my life because as a nine, 10 year old girl, I would get myself up on Sundays and take myself to Sunday school. And religion was a very strong part of my life for the whole of my life. And I really feel it's because of that interaction with my near-death experience. I didn't see anybody that I would say was God or angels or anything like that. I think what I mostly felt was the overwhelming love, uh, whether it come from my reunion family or from a higher source. Because I was so young, it, I, I really couldn't tell you that. but. As I said, because of that experience, it really did change my life, believing in God and, you know, doing good things for people throughout my life. So this is my second near death. So I was very young. I was 20, 22, maybe working as a nurse full time and I needed to have my wisdom teeth out. But I was asthmatic at the time and the dentist wasn't comfortable with doing it in the office. So he made arrangements for me to go to day surgery, have all four of my wisdom teeth out, and then they could uh, monitor me before they sent me home. So the day came and we ended up having to go to a small town about two hours from here in order to have it done because the waiting list was way too long for another to go to a hospital here in Ottawa. So I went and it was your usual prep and things went well in the surgery. And I guess what happened was because of the anesthesia, I had stopped breathing and my heart had stopped. 
in the recovery room. And I just remember all the bells and whistles going off. And remember, I was a nurse at the time. All the bells and whistles going off and somebody bringing the crash cart over to the patient in the bed. And I was standing in the corner and I was watching this and I'm thinking, oh, I better get over there and do my job. So I went over to the bed and I was getting very angry because I couldn't get in near close to the bed to the patient. The people were all doing their things around me and, you know, get me this and get me that and keep doing this and okay, take over CPR, you know, the whole thing. But they wouldn't let me do my job and it was really starting to piss me off. But the next thing you know, I'm up on the ceiling or from a higher plane and I'm looking down and it was like, oh, that's me. So I'm watching them working on me and I'm listening to what they're saying and I'm thinking, wow. And I just watched from there. And so next thing you know, whomp, I'm back in my my body and I wake up and they say, you know, take it easy. You know, you had a little complication after, but you're fine now. We're going to keep you under observation for a little while and then we're going to send you home. And I said, did my heart stop? I said, I died. And the doctor looked at me and said, what are you talking about? And I said, my heart stopped. I said, I saw you do the CPR. And he said, what do you mean? I said, I saw the crash card. I saw you guys working on me. He said, no, 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 no. He said, you didn't see any of that. He said, Wanda, you're a nurse. You know how it goes, you know, the steps to get somebody going. And he said, you weren't gone for that long, but we got you going again and you're fine. And then I looked at him straight in the eye and I said, no, I don't remember what I told him, but I told him something that he'd said to a nurse in the room while this was all going. And it was something that wasn't normal, not something that you would normally say in a code. And he looked at me and his face just went white. And he said, oh, and he couldn't get out of there fast enough. So I thought that was very interesting. And I told my mother on the way home and she had the same reaction as the doctor. And so I really didn't think much of it, but that really changed my life also, because as I said, I was nursing at the time. And whenever I got the chance and there was a patient that I knew was near dying, you know, a few days away, or, you know, they didn't have a lot of family or that type of thing. The staff knew where to find me all the time. I would always be in that room and I always found they were more peaceful and so was I when I was in the room with them. And I'm not saying it's because it was me that was in the room, but it was because there was somebody there that cared. And even if I had just met them the night before or they came in three days ago or they'd been in with us for a month actively dying, I spent that time with them, gently talking to them, assuring them that things are all right. Soon they would be out of pain and, you know, I'm right here. And, you know, I would do things like anything I could do that I could think would make them comfortable. But mostly I just sat there and talked quietly or read a book. Sometimes I would just bring a book with me if it was the middle of the night. Which brings me to a very interesting phenomenon that happened not once but twice. And I honestly believe that I saw two souls leave their body at the moment of death. And both times were different. The first time, again, like I said, it was at the moment of death. And nurses know and practitioners know that there's noises that the body makes and, you know, the settling. And I hate the word, but they call it the death rattle. The first patient, I saw something It was just very much like, think of uh, somebody who's vaping, who's just taken a big puff of their e-cigarette and they're letting it go. And that's what I saw was this mist rose from the body near the heart. And it just sort of floated and then dissipated in the air. And I thought, wow. And I took my stethoscope and put it on their heart and, you know, check the time of death, the usual nursing things. The second time I was again with a, with a patient and this time it was a woman. She was very chatty and very friendly when she was with us before and that type of thing. And you get to know their families. And the family had decided that they were going to go and have a meal or go and get some rest or whatever. And I said, don't worry, I'm here. I'll watch over her. And so I did have a few minutes and I snuck into her room and I was sitting beside her and I said, 
hey, Mrs., I'm here, you know, the family's just gone out, but I'll be with you while you're here. And as I was sitting there, out of the corner of my eye, I literally see her sit up, not her, the body, but her, an essence of her, I don't want to use the term ghost, but that's the best way I could describe it. It was just an essence of her and she literally sat up in the bed and she looked around and then she got up on a plane that I didn't see like a level that I wasn't seeing myself and she stood straight up and she turned around and she looked at herself and then she just sort of walked off and again I checked her her pulse and I checked her um, heart rate and she was gone and that was very profound to me, sitting with the, the patients and being with them near their time was very special to me. And I found comfort for myself and I found a lot of peace with it. I don't necessarily tell that story very often, but when I say that I found it very peaceful to be sitting with dying patients, they think I'm crazy, but I've noticed a trend in the last, I don't know, 10 or 15 years that now there's something called a death doula. And I really feel like that's something that I would love to do. And I would love to be able to be given that chance and be able to have the gift of being with people as they are near the end and crossing over to their side and to their family and to whatever they say is heaven to them. I guess the biggest message I could give to anybody is you shouldn't fear dying. You know, that this is just an outer casing. This is just the wrapping that you happen to have in this lifetime. I always try to remind people that they're human. Too. Don't look down on homeless people because they're human too. And they had family and friend. They were somebody's son. They were somebody's daughter. They, somebody's mother or father. They need to be treated with respect and dignity also. And it's, it's the hardest job I've ever loved. I treated everybody with the respect they deserved. I mean, I always called them Mr. or Mrs. unless they said, until they gave me permission to call them by their first name, I didn't feel I had the right to own that part of them. With addictions, it's different because they respond better to their own name or there's a lot of nicknames. And I make a point my whole life, if I see you on the bus and I like your haircut or I like the color of your hair, oh, I love your bag, where'd you get it? My son gets upset and he says, why do you always talk to people? Because we're human, we need that connection. And somebody telling you that you have a nice purse or, you know, I like that coat, you know, you're going to make that person smile for a minute and give them a better day for the rest of the day.